Hi there everyone, Lars here with my review and analysis for Rings of Power Episode 3, brought to you by Camille's Harem. Not just a podcast for novice writers by novice writers, but also a YouTube channel by novice writers for novice writers. Because writing is an adventure, it's more fun with friends. And I have some thoughts before launching into my usual recap of the episode, wherein I will be examining its respect or lack thereof for Tolkien's lore, why Tolkien wrote what he did, and finally examining the episode as totally original content. Yeah, I know that's a lot to get through, so I'll keep it brief, but if you want to jump ahead, here are the timestamps. You see, I've had a week to think about this show and watch it again. This time I watched it with family and friends, and I have had a ton of conversations with others about this series. And what I realized is this. You have so many better things to do than watch this show. I know I certainly do, but my word is my bond. I said I would review all these episodes, and my anger as a Tolkien fan is blazing hot, and my curiosity as a novice author is worse than a cat's. I rewatched, though, The Fellowship of the Ring and part of The Hobbit during this past week as well. And even the silly often tumbling onto its face first Hobbit movie is filled with so much more lore, characterization, fun, and life that what than anything that I've seen in The Rings of Power. And I found myself growing honestly depressed and then mad because we've already seen Tolkien adapted so beautifully. Why should I waste my time then with garbage like The Rings of Power? No, seriously, I mean it. Don't bother watching the series. Go out for a nice walk. Make dinner for yourself and the people you love. Play that video game you've been putting off for so long. Fix that leaky pipe under the sink. Pull the weeds in your front or backyard. Call someone you haven't talked to in a really long time. Read a good book. Heck, I'll gladly offer you my books because even though I'm a relatively new author on the scene, I can guarantee you that my stories will whisk you away on fulfilling fantasy adventures, unlike what The Rings of Power has done for me and for millions of vocal fans. Let people like me then take the bullet here. I'm willing to do it. Ugh. And you can then just listen to people like me talk about the show, which will be far more entertaining for you, and it will free up your time to go on that walk, cook that amazing dinner, do those much-needed home repairs, or whatever you want to do. Because honestly, just listening to us pontificate about how awful the Rings of Power is will be a kinder fate to you than having to watch this show and how it has failed Tolkien and millions of his fans. Honestly, this show is more disastrous than Numenor's fall. So, I'm just going to finish my opening thoughts right here with an observation. This show hasn't destroyed Tolkien and his legendarium. Anyone who says that is just looking for clicks or is being hyperbolic. No, this show hasn't ruined my love for the books or the previous adaptations. It has only helped me appreciate good storytelling all the more, and it has lit a fire under me to become a better author. Matthew McConaughey once said that everyone should have someone they should chase. He said he chases his future self. And I love that sentiment and philosophy, but I will also chase the standard that Tolkien set. Because why not strive to be the best, even if you never get there? It's the journey that matters, and setting your eyes towards the loftiest peaks means that you will go places no one else has dared to go. Oh, just imagine the adventures that you can go on when you actually strive to be the best. Instead, Rings of Power and all of the showrunners and everyone else, they said that they would plant their flag on that lofty peak, but instead, we watched them huffing and puffing each episode to just go up a small hill. To every one of you who is watching or listening to this, let's you and I go on a real adventure together through the world of Tolkien and the madness that we call writing. Now that I've said all of that, let's quickly go over the general layout of this episode. Uh, it, this episode does a little bit better than the previous one in which there was just all jumbled and we were kept on hopping back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. This episode as well juggles multiple storylines, but at least for a change, we are given a chance to sit down and breathe 
in Numenor, and we get a chance to better understand its people and some of the central characters there. So I am going to focus not on how the episode handles juggling all of this, but I will look at each story individually. And I'm actually going to start off with the one that I liked the most, which was Erendir being a slave to the orcs. Erendir wakes up being dragged by the orcs through this makeshift tunnel that has this canvas over it, and he is chained up and he's put to work with many of the elves from his garrison. The garrison was caught and captured en route back up to Linden, and they are being forced to dig this massive trench that's allowing the orcs to move in daylight. And the elves begin to find some kind of, they're trying to find some kind of way in which they can resist and by showing some sort of resistance the orcs take notice and the orcs are like do they give good sport and one of the orcs rather than torturing the elves for their insubordination for their insolence against their new masters this orc actually gets pretty devious and i really did like this because the orc is like you elves you have earned yourselves an extra ration of water because you show real spirits. And he offers to them some water. And of course the elves are like, nah, we don't really want to accept your water. But the orc is like, come on. You know you're thirsty. You're burning up in the sun and in the heat of the day. So Erendir's commander, whose name I honestly don't remember because they just don't use names in this series, uh, takes the takes the water, he tests it, and finds out it's good. So he passes it to Erendir, who also very haltingly drinks from it, but realizes the water's good, passes it off to his friend, who he had gone on patrols with, and then as his friend tilts his head back to drink the water, that orc pulls out a knife and slashes the elf across the neck and kills him. That was really good. That, were, that was an orc using its brains to torture the elves, not just physically, but psychologically. Now then, this scene should have been way gorier. I thought like they really hampered themselves by staying in the bounds of PG violence for this, but it's good because it lights a fire under the elves and the elves begin to conspire with the humans, who are all slaves here in this trench, to come up with a way in which they can get out. Now, one thing I didn't quite like about this is how the elves are like, we refuse to chop down a tree! It's been here for so long! The elves didn't really care about the trees that much. Ugh, okay, but that little gripe aside, they pull off their rebellion. We get some really nice violence between the elves and the orcs. This is where we get to see the scene from the trailer where Aaron Deer comes flying and swinging and he breaks the canopy. But then they release a warg. This warg looks just like a chihuahua on steroids who then charges on in and begins massacring them. And uh, Aaron Deer... Is, manages to finally kill the warg. Rise, he allows his commander to escape free, and his commander is sniped with arrows and killed, and Arondir is pulled back into the trench, where he will then meet Adar. Adar, who is an elf working with the orcs. Bum, bum, bum! So the leaks are true that the villain of this season is going to be an elf working with the orcs. But honestly, I really did feel like this particular story was well told. This chapter of Arondir's character was condensed nicely. We actually get some great characterization for these members of his garrison who we just passed off as just annoyed, dumb elves. Now we actually get to see them in real peril and we actually get to see them working well together. I like that. That was really good. We then get to basically, well, everything else. So Galadriel and, and Halbrand are taken to Numenor by Elendil. And Elendil brings them before the queen, before the queen regent, Muriel, and they're presented. And the Numenorans like, oh, an elf! No! We haven't had elves here in hundreds of years! Well, I'm going to get to that later on, believe you me. And, they, and, uh, and Galadriel acts like a total Karen. Honestly, she does. Where she's like, no, you will respect me from the golden house of Finarfin. Oh, boy. And you will give me a ship so that way I may sail back and do my duty. And Halbrand has to step on in to basically save Galadriel by actually playing the part of diplomacy. 
And so they're both put under the care of Elendil. Elendil is basically given a very, he's given a promotion that could come with dire consequences if he doesn't fulfill his job to keep an eye on Galadriel and make sure that she doesn't escape or anything like that, which of course she does. She escapes with just wonderful brilliance until Elendil's all, until Elendil corners her at the harbor and Galadriel's about to make a really stupid mistake and capture a dinky little fishing boat to try to sail 300 miles back to Linden. <laughs> so, Oh, it's kind of dumb, but Elendil says, hey, look, if you if you want something, I can take you on over to the Hall of Records. And he speaks in Elvish to her to show that he is an elf friend and that there are still some people in Numenor who aren't entirely hostile towards the elves. And she gets all excited because now she can ride free and go to this tower where the Numenorians as opposed to the elves, happen to have the knowledge of the sigil that was carved into her brother Finrod, which isn't a sigil, it's actually a map. It's a map of Mordor. It's a map of what will later on be part of the kingdom of Gondor. And there are some issues with that, and I'm going to get to that when I start talking about the lore accuracies and inaccuracies. And so now Galadriel feels very confident that everything's going to go over very well, and Ellen Deal, meanwhile, is dealing with his dysfunctional family who are reeling from the loss of their mother. We find out that Anarion does exist, and thank goodness that they didn't screw that up. So, whew, I was wrong there, and I'm happy that Anarion exists, but he's apparently out hanging out on the western shores of Numenor trying to communicate with Valinor. Uh, there, there's something a little bit interesting right there. The sister wants to become an architect, and I believe her name is A. Anarion. I, it was weird. I have no idea exactly what they're trying to do with that name. And then Isildur is an impetuant youth who doesn't actually want to become a sailing guard for the uh, kingdom of Numenor, and is doing something. He's in his rebellious phase. Uh, so we get to see the dysfunctional family of Elendil. Meanwhile, Halbrand is trying to establish a new life for himself on Numenor, and to do that, he wants to become a blacksmith. And so he tries to he tries to get these blacksmiths to bring him on in. He's all like, I will do anything. And they're like, you can't work here until you've earned this. Until you've earned your little token that says that you can indeed be a craftsman here in Numenor. So Halbrand takes advantage of these guys who are trying to bully him at a bar. And he takes the he takes the medallion of one of the men. However, they come and they start beating him up to get revenge after he's played them and everything. So he goes just completely nuts on them and just starts beating them all within an inch of their life, which leads to him being incarcerated. And then Galadriel, being the Mary Sue that she is, is able to bust him out of prison, revealing, I know, Halbrand, that you are the descendant of a king who must unite the people of the Southlands against the orcs. And then Halbrand reveals that he is a descendant of the kings who swore their allegiance to Morgoth during the First Age. And, uh, oh, I cannot forget, though I nearly did forget, The Little Adventures of the Hobbits, where the hobbits are now getting ready for migration. Uh, Nori's family is in a bit of danger because her father has a broken leg. Uh, and the, the hobbits go on this weird pagan dance thing to signify that they're about to go off on on migration and then they have a reading of the names of everyone who has died in previous migrations and they give their thoughts their farewells and their thanks to these people who they've loved who they've lost and then the hobo wizard who has fallen from the sky comes on in finds the pages of whatever his bucket's name is, I still actually don't know who, what the first name is of the leader who leads the hobbits. I finally now know that people call him Burroughs, so I'm going to call him Burroughs. Nori has stolen pages from Burroughs' book, pages about the stars, the wizard sees them, tries to read them, accidentally sets them on fire, causes a whole bunch of hubbub, is finally discovered, and the Brandyfoots are put at the back of the migrating column. Basically, it's a death sentence. But... The wizard is like, Nori, friends, help. And so the, the episode 
comes to an end with the wizard pushing the cart that Nori's father is still pulling on a broken leg to follow the rest of the hobbits as they migrate to the next place where they will bum off the land and harvest food. So there's the story. That Those are the events in basically full of what is going on here. Now then, granted, I skipped over some of the details a little bit because I'm going to attack those details as I now talk about the lore accuracies and inaccuracies within this episode. Okay, so when we look at the lore that Tolkien actually wrote, what is being used here? Let me actually talk about the accuracies within this episode first. So, first of all, Thank goodness that they included Elros and that Elros is Elrond's twin. However, they skipped over quite a bit, and I'll get to that uh, here in a little bit, but at least they have Elros. And I've already said I'm so happy that Anarion actually exists within the story and that they just didn't simply axe him. So uh, we get the brothers that should actually be there in this story. And it's actually accurate that elves have worked with orcs in the past. Now, it's a very, very rare thing. However, the fabled kingdom of Gondolin fell in the first age because an elf betrayed the entire city, all because he really wanted to sleep with his first cousin. Yeah, kind of messed up. So he betrayed everyone because he wanted his cousin, and thank goodness that guy gets killed. But it has happened where elves have allied themselves with orcs in the past. So finding out that Adar is an elf actually makes total sense. And I also do like how the orcs treated their prisoners. They were going for sport. They're not just simply getting work out of them. They torture their captives. This is something orcs do for their own fun and pleasure. And and it's true. If an orc is an orc is wicked and will already hurt people, but orcs really show their wickedness when they're able to get into people's heads and screw around with them. Like what we see with the one orc who offers the elves water and then kills Arondir's old uh, travel partner. So that was really well done. That's one of the reasons why I was pulled in. Not only because that scene actually was played up to pretty good effect. It was pretty intense, but because they stayed true to how orcs actually act. And then, of course, it's great to see Ellen Deal. And I really do think that they nailed the look and sound of Ellen Deal within this episode. And yeah, there you have it. Those are the lore accuracies for this episode. Now. I'm going to talk about how they screwed up the Numenorians so bad. Okay, <laughs> let's start off first with Elrond and with Elros. We need to understand something right here, and this is something that the show completely jumps on over, and as a result, we lose a ton of very important context. In fact, if you actually have the real story, it makes the Numenorians suddenly way more fascinating. At the end of the First Age, Irendil... And, remember, and if you think back to the Lord of the Rings, I give you the light of Irondil, our most beloved star. Irondil is a star. He's a half-elf who, uh, who be basically becomes a star because he gets the Silmaril that was retrieved by Baron and Luthien, and that's a whole wonderful, crazy story on its own, and that is bound to his helm by his wife and allows him to sell, sail into Valinor and as the first mortal man to walk upon the Undying Lands, he pleads before the Valar that they will finally intercede in the war that the Noldor have been waging, saying, everything is going to be defeated and destroyed. All of your beautiful creations, all of these amazing innocent people will suffer and die unless you save them. And the Valar are like, oh boy, this guy makes a very convincing argument. However, you, you are not supposed to be here. So you're going to be made immortal and you're going to be set in the sky. You will never be allowed to step back again on Middle Earth. And your wife cannot go with you. Only once a year will you be allowed to see your wife when you sail across the skies and pass by Valinor. Your wife will get to, turned into a dove and she gets to fly on over to you. It's, it's a bittersweet ending for these two right here. She's also granted immortality, so that way uh, their love can continue, which is kind of nice. Now then, the reason why I bring this up is because Elrond and Elros are the sons 
of Irondil. And it's not just because Irondil helped to convince the Valar to fight against Morgoth at the end of the First Age, bringing about the War of Wrath and ending the war for the Silmarils, but also Irondil saves the armies of Valinor because at the most climactic moment in the great battle, as Morgoth begins to realize that he's actually going to be defeated by the Valar yet again, he unleashes the winged dragons. All dragons up to this point in the story of Middle-earth have been crawlers. Uh, we would normally call them drakes because they don't have wings. Uh, but wingless dragons were the norm, and now winged dragons are unleashed. And not only do they cause massive devastation, but Ancalagong the Black arises. This dragon is massive. He's basically the size of a small continent as he rises up out of the depths of hell and just unleashes devastation onto the lands. It's basically because of Ancalagong that half of the earth sinks into the ocean. And as Ancalagong is fighting against the armies of Valinor and winning, Irondil comes in with the eagle, sailing his ship out of the stars, and he battles Ancalagong the Black in the skies and slays the dragon, crashing his corpse right on top of Morgoth's kingdom and palace and destroying it. And for the valor of Irondil, his sons are granted a special choice. They can choose to either live with the elves and be granted full immortality and the might and beauty and knowledge of the El of the Eldar, or they can live among men and live a blessed and full life, full of longevity, love, might, magic, and knowledge, but they will retain Iluvatar's gift to mortals, which is death. Elrond and Elros go their separate ways. Elrond chooses to be an elf, and he is then adopted basically into the rest of the Noldor clan and becomes the herald to King Gilgalad. Meanwhile, Elros, by becoming a man, he then gathers together the humans who were part of helping to defeat Morgoth, and the Valar and Iluvatar raise out of the seas a blessed, beautiful island, and it is granted to them. And all of Elros's followers are granted the same longevity as him. And so the Numenorean people live for hundreds of years. Now then, this is crucial right here because one of the reasons why the Numenorians will eventually betray the Valar and fight against them is because their longevity wanes over the course of thousands of years. And our Farazan fears dying. He wants everything that the elves have. Basically, he's like, Elros made a mistake. I should be just like the elves. I am better than the elves. And it is this pride and this fear of death that causes the Numenorians to eventually just distance themselves from the elves. And in this case, it's not the elves of Middle-earth, but the elves of Valinor, because it is from Valinor that ships sail with amazing gifts and heralds bring great knowledge and wisdom from the Valar that is imparted to the Numenorians because the Valar and the elves of Valinor love to give gifts to the Numenorians because they just, they're so grateful for what their ancestors did in helping to save Middle-earth. So the Numenorians have this long, illustrious history of pride, dignity, valor, and just advanced magic, technology, wisdom, architect, all of these things. These people should be like the Atlantis of Middle-earth. And it is that same power which Sauron grows to fear, and it's that same power, dignity, honor, and valor through which Sauron is defeated it, at the end of the Second Age, and it is that same dignity, pride, valor, and power that Elrond uh, makes mention to, to Gandalf, how it has weakened over the course of thousands of years, that the pride of Numenor and its legacy are basically all but forgotten by the end of the Third Age. So the Numenorians should be long-lived, the reason, and the, it's not should be the elves of Middle-earth that they don't like, but it's basically the elves of Valinor because they feel like the elves of Valinor are basically 
uh, <laughs> withholding the good stuff from them. And it is the faithful who are still reaching out to Valinor. And Elendil is supposed to be the leader of the faithful. We should actually be seeing him leading those people who are still elf friends and receiving knowledge and wisdom and, and people from Valinor. And they're like, we, we want a better Numenor. We do not support the monarchy that is now seeking for greater power. And one of the ways in which the Numenorians try to exert a kind of power, because they can't, they can't actually get immortality, and they're already the pinnacle of humanity, so how can they get more? Well, they begin colonizing Middle-earth. Numenor should have massive, powerful colonies within Middle-earth, which will be places that Elendil and his followers will eventually flee to when Numenor falls. And it will be those people who will then join forces with the elves to fight against Sauron. Because Numenor is actually in an alliance with Gilgalad and with the other elves to fight against the armies of evil. That is what should be happening already right now. And when I said that Numenor is advanced, it should be. When we look at Numenor here in this episode, it looks like ancient Athens. The armor that they're wearing is bad armor, and it, yes, their ships are advanced, but everything else actually looks kind of pretty regressed. Weirdly enough, when you compare them to the people of the Southlands, the humans of the Southlands, the humans of the Southlands weirdly enough, almost look more advanced because we understand that they're supposed to be in kind of a medieval time. And when we look at the people of Numenor, it's taking us back to ancient Athens. And we know that ancient Athens came before the Dark Ages, and the Dark Ages were more advanced than ancient Athens. And so there's actually this weird incongruency right here where it's like, wait a second, why are these weird backwards people from the Southlands more advanced than the people of Numenor? They actually aren't, but the way that the show has decided to depict the Numenorians actually makes them look more backwards. It's annoying. <laughs> and, oh my gosh, the Queen Regent Mariel knows she is the Queen, but, however, she is forced into a marriage with her cousin Arpharazan, who wishes to seize the throne for himself and all of the power that comes with it, so that way he can conquer Middle-earth, and eventually Sauron persuades him to try to conquer Valinor, and thereby seize the immortality that he believes is supposed to be his. So, again, so, Mariel is not exact. she shouldn't be the queen regent, she should be the unwilling wife to our Farazan at this point in time. And our Farzan would definitely not be treating Galadriel really well. So, I mean, that's kind of, that does kind of make sense with how they're treating Galadriel. But, oh boy, the thing is this, is that they had not cut off contact with the elves. In fact, our Farzan actually would have wanted contact with the elves on Middle Earth because he wanted to know what they were doing. It's a great way of spying on them. Plus, they gave, plus there's trade and he can use them in assistance for fighting against Sauron. So that way he can conquer Sauron's people and then he can turn his attention against the elves. There's a whole lot of politicking and whatnot going on. It's actually really cool what Tolkien wrote, but none of that is here. And, oh boy, the Hobbits. I am actually going to get to that when I talk about original content. But suffice it to say, everything that's being done here with the Hobbits is absolutely fan fiction. And in fact, as I'm going to talk about later on, it is fan fiction written horribly. And I do mean horribly. It is so bad. I had to get up and leave. And I couldn't watch the episode for like a full hour because I was so angry with the horrifyingly bad world building and characterization that we got for these hobbits. Oh my gosh. Let me just say this as far as lore and accuracies go. Hobbits are supposed to be the salt of the earth. They're supposed to be some of the best people despite their faults. Almost everything that we saw here in this episode says that the hobbits are jerks, and I actually don't mind now if the wolves come and devour half of them, or most of them, because they are jerks who are willing to murder their own people and not even have the gall or the dignity to do it with their own hands. So this show completely degrades Tolkien's Hobbits. And that just ticks me off. And I, yes, oh boy, I should not forget this little juicy bit right here that kind of irks me that the orcs apparently are now vampires and they can't stand being in the sunlight. 
No, Tolkien did not write them in such a way that they burn and basically dissolve when the sun hits them. No, the sun makes them weak. We know that trolls turn into stone when the sunlight hits them unless the dark powers truly flow through them and they are filled with the will of the wicked one, of Sauron or Morgoth, which empowers them. So they can grow weak in sunlight, or if they're trolls, they can turn to stone if they're not being fully empowered, but they're not going to burn or be in a whole lot of pain. They don't like it. It's like it's like for us staring up into the sun, being like, ah, oh, that hurts a whole lot. That's like for them walking out into the sunlight. It's like that for them when they do that, but it doesn't burn them. It doesn't destroy them. It just only makes them very weak and very irritated. <sighs> Okay, so there's obviously a whole lot more that I could get into as far as the many, many different kinds of intricacies in regards to the lore. I mean, we've learned now more about the sigil that was carved into Finrod's body here in the show, which never obviously happened. And then on top of that, apparently it's a map of Mordor. It's assigned to everyone that they're supposed to go to Mordor. How is anyone supposed to know that, especially because... Almost everything that happened in the First Age regarding Sauron happened in the Far West, a part of the world that no longer exists. When he came to the other half of Middle-earth, he discovered Mordor and realized it would be a really great place to set up shop. Ugh, there's so many other things. But we would then again be here for hours going over all of the different problems. So let's pump the brakes on the complaining, and let's talk about why Tolkien wrote what he wrote. And for this case, I really want to focus in on the Numenorians. Tolkien played around with his own Atlantean myth with the Numenorians, but he gave them a really great origin through the hero of Irindil and his sons Elrond and Elros. And there's a whole lot of thematic goodness just happening right here with the Numenorians. Addressing the matter of their longevity, but ultimately the fact that they are immortal and that they will die at some point, Tolkien wrote humans as having a gift, the gift of death, and that the elves and the dwarves don't really understand that. Even though the dwarves aren't immortal and will die, the dwarves live long, fulfilling lives. And then the elves, of course, are immortal. Why is it that the humans don't get to live so very long and that they die? Their lives are just so fleeting. Well, that is one of the beauties of mortality. Death means that there is an end. And so that means that you have a limited time in your journey, which then means that the qualities that make you a good person become all the more valuable as you seek to do good things here on this earth. You can dive into the vast philosophy of what it really means to be human right here. Tolkien did not want to take that away from humanity in his fantasy world. And ultimately then, by giving longer life to the Numenorians, the Numenorians were given, this was meant to be a gift, by being given longer lives, they were then given a chance to learn and to develop more than any normal human could and find greater joy and happiness in this life. It was truly a blessed gift, and that then when they passed away, while it was a sad thing, each generation of Numenorians could look to that previous generation and just be like, thank you for everything you've given us, and for the time that we could have together. We had hundreds of years, and now we will get to spend hundreds of years more with a greater legacy because of what you gave us, and we can pass that on to our children. It's a very beautiful thing, and it makes their fall all the more sad because they had truly everything. But the fear of death is what made them turn their backs on Valinor and eventually lead Arpharazon to trust Sauron and invade Valinor towards the end of the Second Age and thereby bring about the entire end of the Numenorean kingdom. And then they lose their longevity and, and everything that had been granted to them by the elves except for what Elendil and his followers are able to rescue from Numenor before its fall. This very crucial aspect to the, Norman, to the Numenorians themselves helps to bring out more of these questions and discussions about what it means to be human, 
Why are we here on this earth? How do we find the most joy, satisfaction in this life? We should learn from the Numenorians. The Numenorians are a fantastic cautionary tale, just as Atlantis is supposed to be a cautionary tale. But Tolkien gave it actually even more richer depth than what we actually than what we have for the actual legend of Atlantis. So great on you, Tolkien, for writing an amazing Atlantis story. And all of that technology and all of that great history and everything is crucial to the Third Age because so much of what the Numenorians had becomes signs that Aragorn is the rightful heir to the throne of Gondor. And on top of that, a lot of what they left behind becomes either very crucial items and tools for the heroes or for the villains to use against the heroes. And it's just, ah, it's so good. There are long, long reaching consequences of the Numenorians. And it just also shows the legacy of what heroes like Irondil leave behind. It's a way of connecting all of the ages, showing that history is truly interconnected. That, as Ellen Deal says, which is absolutely incorrect, it's like, if you, we must move on from the past, because if you can't move on from the past, you will die with it. And no, that's definitely not how Tolkien would have seen anything. And Ellen Deal himself would never have seen it that way. The past informs who we are now and helps us to decide who we should be in the present in order to create the ideal future for ourselves. That is the impressive message that Tolkien is trying to get across here. The Numenorians are a window into humanity, and that is really, really cool. Let's now talk about this this episode as if it were a completely original story and has absolutely nothing to do with Tolkien. Tolkien never existed. The Lord of the Rings was never written. We don't have the lore of the Legendarium. This, the Rings of Power, is its own story. Well, this episode, like I said earlier, did Aaron, did Aaron Deer, I think, actually really well. That was good, tight storytelling. We get some good characterization. And I, I enjoyed it. It was some decent action. I like the way that the orcs were portrayed. You definitely get that villainy coming through and the desperation of the elves. And it's nice to see that the elves aren't just like, no, what happened to us? No. Nah. Like kind of how I think they might have been tempted to write them, but we actually get to see the elves planning, fighting back. And it's it's pretty good. I, I liked it. It was obviously doomed to fail. They're a little breakout attempt. Uh, but, uh, but overall, I like the action. I like the characterization, especially for the orcs. That was well done. However, coming to Numenor, there's a big problem with Galadriel coming to Numenor, and it is the animosity that is shown towards her. It's not really explained. This animosity between the elves and the humans doesn't really make sense. In the Southlands, okay, the elves have had an occupation and the humans didn't like that. I can kind of accept that, especially for when they think that, hey, there's no reason for you guys to be occupying our lands. However, for the Numenorians, it doesn't really make much sense, especially when we, when we learn of their connection to the elves through Elros. So, where is this animosity coming from? It would be nice to see that. So, things just don't quite add up and they don't really add up as things go on because Galadriel is just she is such an unlikable Karen and Mary Sue character she comes to Numenor and everyone hates her and then by the end of the episode they're doing a little play a little puppet play about how Galadriel's defeating the wicked one and is saving Numenor and everyone's like yay Galadriel where did that come from if this island is truly antagonistic towards elves in general why are there now a bunch of new Minorians being like, hey, elves are cool, and we're going to do this play about how great Galadriel is. This is a sure sign of a Mary Sue. And the problems with Mary Sue's is that it gets rid of all challenges for that character and does not provide for any good character growth or development in any kind of way. In fact, the, the show is already committing a horrible mistake that so many anime shows make, which is... Character development for my OP bland character is that they get another power up. 
And right here for Galadriel, her character development is she's got information that will help her to defeat Sauron. Yay! Her quest continues. Her quest is progressing, but her character is not. The interaction between the Queen and Galadriel could have been amazing. The, you have the entire court there. You could have had some great grilling of Halbrand and Galadriel, where they have to defend their actions and their histories. The Numenorians could show, hey, we actually know quite a bit. We know about you, Galadriel, from our histories. Why would the commander of the Northern Armies be here? Where's your army? You being stuck out in the middle of the ocean and rescued by Elendil proves that something is greatly amiss with your story. If you are going to stand before me, the queen, and you're going to brandy about all of your amazing titles, you're going to have to defend your title and defend why you are here in my kingdom unwanted. You know who I am. I'm the queen right here. You know my you know the illustrious history of my people and you are very clearly in my power right here. Halbrand would have had this great moment to really show what his knowledge is because Halbrand is really proving himself to be one of the more interesting characters, but Galadriel not so. And just the way that she's able to bend Elendil now to her will, and she's like, I have the information about you, Halbrand. All of the interesting little mysteries are now being solved, and they're solved because Galadriel went and read some books. And it also gets really dumb because you think that, wait a second, if the elves have so much great knowledge, they have thousands of years worth of knowledge, why is it that this little island nation that's cut itself off for hundreds of years would just happen to have the answer hidden away in its archives? It's so dumb. It's clear that they're trying, It's and ah, there's things in this that it's clear that they're trying to rip off. Uh, the Game of Thrones with a knockoff maester and other such people. Oh my gosh. It's just, when I look at everything that has to do with Galadriel in this episode, if you actually take a moment and step back and think about it, what we see happening right here is the plot is just handing her everything she needs. Galadriel's not struggling. Halbrand saves her from her own stupidity, which could have been interesting, but no, instead, she is correct about everything. Elendil will just happily be an elf friend to her, even though she is doing everything in her power to tick him off. He shouldn't be helping her, but he does because it's Galadriel. And because it's Galadriel, she now gets all the information that she needs. So that way now she can strut about at the end of the episode and be like, I'm going to stay here in Numenor a little bit longer because soon I will have an army. Soon I will have the queen in my good graces. And soon you will be helping me to defeat the orcs. Everything is coming together because she's a Mary Sue. And what's worse is that she's acting like a total Karen, demanding everything and getting everything. There is no real characterization for Galadriel. If I read this character in a book, I would skip her chapters and just read leaks online to fill myself in for anything that I missed. Because I can't stand her. And I'm just going to say this, as someone who has actually written characters, main characters even, who I wrote to be unlikable, here's the thing. You still have to give them some sort of redeeming quality so that way people are invested. And here's the thing. I have written my own characters, even main characters, who are not supposed to be the best of people. You're, and some of them I've even designed for my readers to dislike at first. When I wrote Sandwich Desperados, the main character is a real idiot to the point where you just roll your eyes and you're like, oh, come on, dude, you're so dumb. And yet at the same time, his determination to win in the girl of his dreams is endearing and his relationships with other people are fun as well he's not someone who just shoves everyone away he's not someone who's lacking social graces he has those he's just an idiot and you go along with his idiocy and you then realize how that plays into the overall plot and it's his dynamic with other characters that make him then interesting that's why I wrote him. I then wrote another character for one of my upcoming books who is, at the beginning, unlikable. Which you're like, ah, oh, no, an unlikable main character. Eh. But over the course of the book, it's actually his journey towards becoming a much better person. And by becoming a better person, you then start rooting for him by the end of the book. So it's not a bad thing to write characters who are, are at first unlikable, but it is essential to write characters that are nonetheless 
good. <laughs> they have to have good interactions. They have to have something that is redeemable about them, something that makes people want to continue reading them. It's honestly one of the reasons why when I've read the Game of Thrones series, why every chapter that is Cersei Lannister's point of view, I can't read them because she's so stupid. She is so dumb. There is nothing redeemable about that character. So having to read chapter after chapter after chapter of her perspective is pointless. It's honestly dumb. I just, I'll be honest. I was like, okay, I'm just going to skip Cersei's chapter. I'm going to skip Cersei's chapter. Do a little bit of searching up here on Google. Okay, there you go. I just learned everything I needed to know. And then boom, when I get to the end of the fifth book and she is, and she is betrayed, I was like, yeah, no, I totally get that. Everything right there makes absolute sense. I'm totally caught up. <laughs> and I didn't have to read her annoying perspective. And that's one of the things here is that we're saddled with Galadriel. We can't escape her. Ugh. And here is a huge problem within this particular episode. Again, just we are missing context. General context overall. Why is Numenor so important? Who are the Numenorians? We really don't get that. The explanation is absolutely minimal truly minimal and then we need context for the discussion that elendil has with his children here's the thing i already know due to leaks that elendil's wife recently passed away and that's why there's a lot of tension within the family the thing is is that if you don't know that you think that isildur is going insane because he's hearing a voice in his head and you think that this is just a generally dysfunctional family the conversation that they're having with the knowledge that that Elendil's wife passed away makes that scene make more sense. But if you don't know that, and I was like, hey, you know what? What if I divorce myself of that? And I just think about this scene just in general. I was like, I'm totally lost. Why are these characters acting this way? None of these characters are are really engaging or interesting. And Ellen Deal just kind of gives you a whiplash because you're like, is he a noble elf friend or is he just a, or, or a sucky father? I really don't know. And that's one of the things that just kind of sucks because when you know Ellen Deal's character within the lore, he should be awesome. And I really want Ellen Deal to be awesome here in this story, but I'm getting whiplash as far as his character goes. And I'm just missing context for better understanding the family. Now then, I'm pretty certain that we're going to get it in a future episode, but if you're going to do an in-depth conversation between characters, we need to understand why they're having that conversation. In this scene, which should have been really great, we're getting none of that. So, context is key. This episode was missing a whole lot of context. It was being pushed along by a Karen and a Mary Sue merged together in this horrifying form that has claimed the name of Galadriel and we get to the hobbits okay okay there's real anger here on this one they the, the writers the showrunners are morons absolute morons there's no other way of putting it right here do these guys not understand how a community is supposed to work oh boy uh okay <laughs> But just in general, they let me start here where the sin get the sin just made me come off the rails because I realize I'm becoming incoherent right here. We get to see the hobbits perform this crazy little pagan dance to signify that they're about to go on migration. And if any one of these people who takes part in this show ever again says anything about other people appropriating another person's culture, give these people a slap to the face because that scene right there that felt so disingenuous merging native american culture with just a really weird display of medieval pagan festivals i mean there's something interesting there but this little procession hardly makes any sense again we're lacking the context and it felt like cultural appropriation to me it didn't feel like anything new or interesting if anything i was like yeah you know i've seen this done way better in spice and wolf so that was really dumb but then this grand procession is meant to signify that they're about to go out on migration yet again but before they leave everyone gathers together to have a moment of remembrance to those they have lost along the way throughout that year, which is actually a really touching thing to do. But here's the problem. They were talking about how 
they are going to continue going on. If anyone falls behind, they are left behind to die. The hobbits here in this scenario will not take care of their own. And yet, as they remember the people who have died, they then say, we're waiting for you to each name of a person who has died. Oh my gosh! How can you say that? How can you say we are waiting for you when you very clearly leave people to die? That is stupid! That flies in the face of everything that you're doing right here. You have belittled what could have been in a, a beautiful and amazing scene. But not only that, these people do not understand how nomadic cultures even work. Okay, I've brought up my whole thing about how they should be hunting and not just simply gathering because there's no nomadic people who just went to go and just harvest stuff that they hoped would be there. The hobbits should be hunting some sort of herd, but they aren't. And that's already a big problem. But okay, we're just going to have them be gatherers. Then here's another problem. All nomadic tribes have domesticated animals. They need domesticated animals to help them move stuff around and to get food. Why do the hobbits not have domesticated animals? We see that in the Shire, they have all kinds of domesticated animals. They have dogs. The very first animal that any nomadic tribe will have at their side is a dog. Because dogs help them hunt. Dogs help protect the people. Dogs are man's best friend. Dogs are essential to a nomadic lifestyle. Why are there no domesticated animals here? And those domesticated animals could be used to help push along the carts and carry stuff, but they aren't there. So that means that the hobbits need to actually share resources in order to share manpower. You don't have one massive overbloated cart per family. That is wrong. You only do that if your family is huge, and none of these hobbits' families are large by any extent, which flies in the face of what the hobbits even are. Anyways, if you have small families, you combine forces. You want to know how the pioneers, Mormon and the like, all got across the plains by working together. You don't just leave someone behind. Oh my gosh, if you actually look into the story of the pioneers, any breed of pioneer, if anyone dared say we're going to leave someone behind, they would practically be jumped by everyone else because you don't do that you don't break up the family and you need everyone you need all the strength that you can get you need all of that skill and you don't just leave a family that could help to propagate the, f the population and keep the clan afloat you don't just leave them to die you would never do that you don't abandon people okay sure so nori's father now has a broken leg the fact that he's pulling a cart at the end of the story when he should be in the back of the cart and the big wizard should be pulling the cart is stupid but on top of that no nomadic people would just abandon someone especially a healthy male to just die it doesn't happen sure there are Eskimos who would leave people out on the ice to die, but that is the elderly who know that they are at the end of their life. And if someone was really, really horribly mangled, you would help them pass on. But if someone has a broken arm or a broken leg, okay, you know what? There are tons of things that need to be done around the camp. We're going to make sure that you do that while you heal, so that way we can then use your strength and your expertise to help keep everyone alive later. That is how nomads work. They help take care of each other because if you just let someone die, that is a huge blow to the community. All small communities, whether they move or are stationary, rely on everyone. Even if one family disappears, it is a blow to the community. And especially that someone has a lot of knowledge. Oh boy, there goes all that knowledge. There goes all that expertise that could have helped the entire community. So when someone in a small community, whether they be on the move or stationary, everyone bands together to help someone out. So in this case, Nori's father would be loaded up in someone else's cart, and most likely you would have two or three families per cart so that way they could share the load and work together to move everything. But we get none of that here. This is so stupid. On the level of world building, it is awful. Yes, I am ranting about this. Why? Because it is dumb. These showrunners promise to give us epic fantasy. 
epic fantasy means that it is truly fantastical big it is a is a mythical land that we wish to seep ourselves into but at the same time it is logical and makes sense in such a way even in a fantasy situation that if we should find ourselves in that world it would make sense that is the nature of epic fantasy and they have failed they have failed at writing epic fantasy and they have failed to write a decent nomadic people i hate these hobbits Gollum. Kill these hobbitses, strangle them, purge them from Middle-earth, squeeze them and eat their children, rob their cradles, poison their food, kill these nasty hobbitses who would dare turn their backs on their own. These hobbits are awful. There is nothing redeemable about them. Nori and her family would be perfectly fine off on their own. And then Mr. Burroughs with his book of knowledge. Oh my gosh, this is so dumb. And in fact, it's actually a great way in which they could have opened up a window or a door to more possibilities for Nori to learn from other hobbits in order to gain knowledge, in order to go on her quest to help the wizard. Because here's the thing, nomadic people did not have books. Ugh. This doesn't mean that nomadic people didn't actually have a form of writing. In fact, if we go back, I mean, we've got all the different cave scrawlings, but let's actually go and have a look at Native American cultures or Mongolian cultures or Arabic cultures where you have tons of nomads. They actually had ways of writing that they would use in very special moments to preserve very important information to be handed maybe off to the next generation. But all important information would also be orally transmitted within an oral history stories memorizations family lineage all of this stuff is orally communicated in fact we can see this being alive and well in certain african cultures where people within certain african tribes will memorize for years very important information history and lineages which they can then recite purely from memory and then pass on to the next generation it is a beautiful custom and it is one that links generations together fosters communication and allows the younger generation to learn from the older generation in order to become better but we don't get any of that here all of that stuff is lost because these hobbits are stupid, selfish, and self-destructive. How could you get these people so wrong? So, yeah, look here. This episode, it's its so weird because it has some great stuff. Everything that's happening with Aaron Deer, I really liked. And if I could divorce myself from Tolkien, the, the new Minorian island actually looks really cool and really neat, and I like to see some of its culture. I'd like to see more of it. But the thing is this is that we are lacking a lot of context. There's a lot of inconsistencies. And the story is being pushed along by a Mary Sue Karen character. And a lot of other stuff, a lot of world building just doesn't make any sense. And without the context, it's hard to identify with any of the characters. The one bright spot for me, really, was actually Halbrand. Because within this episode, we get to actually see more of a character for him. We get to see that he is smart, observant. He is, an, he is a pretty good thief, though he does get caught. So he's not exactly a master thief. And he is someone who is dealing with a lot of guilt. And so we're actually getting a whole lot of good characterization for Halbrand. Halbrand, by this point in the story, he's only been around for two episodes, actually has more in-depth character progression than any character so far within this series. And he's the one person I'm like, I actually am willing to watch more of you. And... I, I mean, it was cool how he, how he stole the knife back from Elendil and then gave it to Galadriel with his smolder moments. Hey, we're going to do some Netflix and chill later, Galadriel, in my prison cell. Kinky. Uh, <laughs> Halbrand is at least an interesting character. But here's the thing. This show clearly wants Halbrand to be a variation of Aragorn, of Strider. 
and they're trying to play off all of these different mysteries about who he is and everything like that. If I compare this, though, actually to The Lord of the Rings, and not because I'm going to be like, see, see, Tolkien did it better, but let's actually have a look in terms of comparison to see what the show is getting wrong with introducing a mysterious hero. It all again comes back to context, understanding what's going on. When we're introduced to Strider, Strider is seen as this dangerous wild man, this ranger who wanders the wilds. And when Frodo has his accident with the One Ring at the uh, at the end of the Prancing Pony, Aragorn, Strider's the one who rescues him and says, you draw far too much attention to yourself, Mr. Underhill. And then we kind of have the speech of riddles. But it actually makes sense because, as Frodo says, what do you want? And Aragorn replies with a little more caution from you. That's no trinket you carry. I can avoid being seen if I wish, but to disappear entirely, that is a rare gift. And he reads that Frodo is frightened. So he's like, are you frightened? Frodo says, yes. He's like, not nearly frightened enough. I know what hunts you. The other hobbits come in to attack. Aragorn draws his sword. It looks like a fight's about to happen. But then Aragorn sheathes his sword, compliments Sam's courage, but then says that's not going to be enough. They are coming. The Nazgul arrive, and Aragorn saves the hobbits. So in really quick succession, we realize, okay, this man is a good guy. At least he's helping out the hobbits. And then we have a conversation between Frodo and Merry about how do we know that this guy is actually a friend of Gandalf's. And Frodo says, I think that an, that an emissary of the enemy would... Uh, look fairer and feel fouler. So we have characters making observations, figuring things out for themselves, and then Aragorn shows through his deeds that he is indeed someone to be trusted. And this goes on for a little while. We get used to Aragorn as Strider before it is revealed that he is the heir to the throne of Gondor and that he is actually a king in exile. And that that is really good. And the thing is this, is that we're given a chance to truly get to know who Strider is before it being revealed who he truly is. Now then, with Halbrand, we don't really have a whole lot of time to get to know Halbrand as a character. He's more wrapped up in an enigma. And it's one of the reasons why I did like a lot of what we get to see here in this episode, by seeing how he is a diplomatic person, how he is a thief, how he is skilled and how he's also very dangerous. And then we get the reveal that he is the descendant of the king who is supposed to unite the people of the Southlands. And the one reason why I feel like this doesn't exactly work as well as getting to know Strider and then Aragorn is because we truly get to know Strider as Strider before realizing that, er that he is Aragorn the heir to the throne of Gondor. We haven't really gotten to know Halbrand as Halbrand. It's been kind of thrust on us that Halbrand is supposed to be a king. And because that is the case, well, now we've moved on from swashbuckling cool Halbrand to Halbrand the king in exile. And it's gone so fast that, again, this is like, this is a character getting leveling, is getting leveled up because the Mary Sue Galadriel demands it to be so. And that robs Halbrand of great personal characterization and progression for himself. Instead, this is just thrust upon him. So, yeah. <laughs> oh boy. I, I'll be honest. I'll, I'll be honest. I did not expect to dislike this episode as much as I ended up hating it. But there it is. Uh, there's so much in this episode that is wrong. And yet at the same time, I can actually see real gems with the character of Elendil. There's a real gem with, with, that's happening with the elves being taken captive by the orcs. There's a gem with Halbrand. There's a gem with Elendil's family. But none of it is given proper context, time to breathe, or, or really a chance to grow on its own and for us to understand it and fall in love with it. And a lot of that comes down to the way that the story is again chopped up and we have multiple things that we're juggling and the fact that the story is being pushed ahead by a Mary Sue. And a Mary Sue character robs the rest of the world of its chance to progress naturally like any good narrative should. So as novice writers, what can we actually then learn from this? This episode should teach you what not to do. Number one, know your world building. 
Get to actually know how communities work. Don't just write how you think a, com a community could work in order for it to be dysfunctional so that way you can have some drama. A, a community works because it, it functions properly. Dysfunctionality comes down to personalities within the community. And when we look at the hobbits, it's just all a mess. It's not even a matter of personalities. Their very culture is awful. And if you intend it to be that way, then you should draw attention to it. Instead, they're trying to pass off the hobbits as just as these are supposed to be the good guys when they aren't. It's it's genuinely awful. They this story does not understand its own world building. You need to understand how people work, how societies work, how traditions work and go from there. This is all part of the iceberg, the 90% that no one else sees, the work that you put into your story so that way it works logically, even if it's fantasy. And you know what? There are some bonkers, fantastic, over-the-top fantasy stories out there that are still logical within the rules that they've established. Right here with Rings of Power, this is all just all over the place. Another big tip is this, do not write Mary Sue characters because they rob the plot and all the other characters around them of being able to progress naturally. Because the very core, at the very core of what a Mary Sue character is is that whatever they want, they get. And when that's the case, there is truly no conflict. Show to me where Galadriel really faces conflict. Basically, so far, it's that King Gilgalad won't let her pursue her vengeance. But the thing is this is that that doesn't really matter because she goes and pursues her vengeance anyway. The challenge really isn't there. And especially because already by the end of this episode, things are lining up for her in order to basically win the Numenorians over and to have their armies to fight against Sauron's forces in the Southlands. Well, whoop de doo there was so much drama. I really don't know what they're going to do to pump any sort of life or intrigue into Galadriel's plot because it isn't there. And Halbrand wasn't given time to fully develop as a character. That's something that you need to do. You need to let characters have a chance to develop as they are supposed to be. And if you're writing a character who has a who has a hidden identity, which I've been doing with some of my own stories, that's absolutely fine. You develop the face that they present to the world and you let people get to know that face for a good amount of time. So that way then you can pull it away and be like, haha, this is who this person really is. And then it hits with force. Finding out that Halbrand is the descendant of kings didn't hit with the energy that it should have because it came too fast and it came in a way that didn't complement Hal Brand's character progression. And my last bit of advice to you novice authors out there of what we can learn from this story is again a matter of pacing. When this episode allowed us to actually spend time with some of these new characters from Numenor, it felt good and it was really nice. And I was almost lured into a false sense of security that the show was actually getting good before I then realized all the things that they were doing wrong, but the pacing was better in this episode. Again, it shows why pacing matters. Pacing is so important, and pacing does change from story to story, what you want to tell. But it's very important that when you're introducing new characters, you need to give us time to understand who these characters are are. So the show was doing that, but it was lacking some of the context to help us truly understand some of the dynamics that we need to understand going forward. And this leads to one of the big storytelling mistakes that the acolytes of J.J. Abrams do, and that is mystery box storytelling. And that's something that I'm definitely going to get into later because honestly, that deserves its own special video about why, like what it really is and why it sucks, but in cases where it actually does succeed, which is honestly very rare. So yeah, <laughs> I'll have to do that later on because this video is already getting pretty long. And like I said at the beginning, we all have better things to do with our time. And I've got books I'm still working on. There's other videos to work on. There's amazing things to watch and to read. And if you're looking for something cool to read, please check out my books. Bleed, Steam, and Steel, Knights of Halley Cruz, Sandwich Desperados, or the book I just most recently released, The Dark Rebellion, which is a sequel to Knights of Halley Cruz. 
and I'll have a link for those down in the description below. But if you're a novice author who's looking for more writing advice, please check out our other videos here on our YouTube channel, or you can also head on over to our podcast, Camille's Harem, found on Podbean, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, The Works. We have writing exercises for you to check out over at our Pinterest page, and we would love for you to join our ever-growing community of novice authors. Links for all of that and more are down in the description below. And until the next video, y'all, please don't write Mary Sue characters, and choose.